country deserves a lot of attention. There are a lot of problems. And the problems are manifested by a lot of people being upset in this country. And I think a lot of people have that. We're all upset and we want to change it in Washington. Matter of fact, that's what our purpose is. something, you have to know I'm what's wrong. As a physician, if I didn't get the diagnosis right, I couldn't possibly get the treatment right. So therefore, the diagnosis is very important because right now, most people in this country know there's something seriously wrong. There's something seriously wrong with our foreign policy. And of course, we all know there's something seriously wrong with our monetary system and seriously wrong with our Federal Reserve system. Well, I think the uh, best way to boil down the crisis that we face is a debt crisis. We're in too much debt. It's unsustainable. Our productivity is going down. Their special interests have benefited. The Wall Streeters get bailed out, and the debt is being dumped on the people, and that has to be reversed, let me tell you. But we're in this, we're in this trouble because we haven't followed the rule of law. The rule of law is the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 is very clear. It tells us exactly what we're allowed to do, and we're not allowed to do anything that is not explicitly given to us in the Constitution. Matter of fact, the Constitution is mainly a document of prohibitions, prohibitions against the federal government intruding in our lives and intruding our economic conditions. And also, there is no authority in the Constitution to become the policeman of the world. that we should have a strong national defense, and that is a vital function of the federal government. We also know that if you do not take care of financial affairs at home, this, the problems that we can get from, from the problems overseas may magnify. The Soviet, the Soviet system collapsed for economic reasons, not for military reasons. So. We have to maintain a healthy economy every bit as much as we have to have a strong national defense. One of the reasons we've gotten into trouble overseas has been we haven't followed the rules. It's been a long time since this country declared a war. The last time we did it, after we were attacked, and properly so, we, would, uh, we attacked uh, both Japan and Germany, and guess what? It was declared by the Congress and is supported by the people. It was over in approximately four years. We had proper authority, and we were together. Since that time, we haven't done it. I maintain that a president should never take a country to war unless there is a declaration of war and fight them and win them and get them over with. For many years, young men and women have been called to service. Some of us have been drafted, others have joined with the purpose of providing defense for this country. But because so many of our young people have in the past and currently join to defend this country, they can become disillusioned if they find out that the fighting and the killing and the spending of the money doesn't provide national defense, that we're not under threat, that sometimes we go looking for trouble and putting our troops in harm's way unnecessarily.
And because, this, and because our country is literally bankrupt, we can't pay our bills, and we have to keep borrowing, we keep spending, we keep printing money, and we cannot maintain this presence around the world. So therefore, we can't even afford to take care of our people back home. So my suggestion is to look carefully at our foreign policy and question whether or not we should be in 130 countries and have 900 bases. I say that's way too many. It's time to come home from most of those places. But too often, too often when we've been called uh, to duty and, and so many of us have gone, coming back home has not always been the best of uh, receptions. Think today, as both a physician and a congressman, and having been in the military, I have to deal with a lot of veterans' problems. It's very, very frustrating because so often veterans are shunned. They don't get the treatment they really deserve, and the money is being wasted elsewhere. It took a long time for the victims of Agent Orange in the uh, Vietnam War to finally get all their treatments, Persian Gulf War Syndrome. And even today, we're currently suffering from abuse of our veterans when they come home. Hundreds of thousands are looking for help. I had a young man the other day who was just got out of the military, and of course he was sad and despondent about how many fellow soldiers that were killed when he was over in Iraq. But he says, you know what's happening now? He says, some of my buddies now are committing suicide. It's like an epidemic. So there's something terribly wrong with the system where, uh, where it ends up so tragically and, and the help isn't available. But I believe that it's related to our foreign policy. The foreign policy should dictate how we go about, how we go to war. We should obey the Constitution, go very sparingly, and we should go preserve the peace and prosperity and the safety of this country, but not to go looking for trouble in different places of the world. We've had a foreign policy that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So often we go around and we find a friendly dictator and say, well, our national security interests are best if we prop up this dictator. No matter what he does to his people, we've done it numerous times. So we give him a lot of money. And then it goes badly and he changes his mind and then we have a fight. Then there's other countries we go to and they don't want to cooperate with us. So uh, we just go ahead and we use weapons, of man, of weapons and destroy their country and bomb those countries. So we either use force or money, force or money. And I thought, well, there has to be another option. How about talking to them once in a while instead of using force and intimidation? During the, I, was, I was called to, do, called to duty, called, called to the service in 1962 during the missile crisis of Cuba. That, that was resolved rather quickly, but then I was in the Air Force for five years later. I did not go to Vietnam, but it was during that period of time. But if you add up the decade the French were there and the decade the, uh, the Americans were in Vietnam, t trying to settle a civil war in Vietnam, how many people were killed? Probably maybe a million Vietnamese, tens of thousands of, uh, of, uh, of French soldiers, and then 60,000 Americans. And then we had to leave after all this money and waste. And what did that usher in economically? They said, and Johnson at the time said, we can have guns and butter, it doesn't matter. Spend money on more welfare and more guns. And then they gave us the 60s, which were a very, very uh, bad time. But the argument, for us to go there. It wasn't the argument go to the Congress and find out whether we should declare war or not. The argument was that if we don't go there and stop communism from rolling over, there'll be a domino effect and that whole region will turn communist. Well, it turned out that we walked away from there after a lot of tragedy. China 
they became less communistic when we left. They became capitalistic in many ways, and now they're our banker. So what is, what's happened in Vietnam? Has it gotten worse? Did they go communist? No. All of a sudden, they became westernized. They liked, by looking at what we were doing, they started trading and, and interrelating with us. We travel there. We invest there. They come here. And just think of what has been achieved between our two countries in peace and what was not achieved in war and waste. We need to look at that. A strong America is necessary. A strong America is going to give us a much better, peace, a much better chance for peace. But also what we need is we also have to have prosperity as well, and therefore economic conditions are so important. Debt is the big problem right now that we're facing, and we have to admit it. So even if somebody would say, no, we can't cut a nickel out of the military budget, just remember the military budget is different than the defense budget. The military budget is all that what all the weapons the military industrial complex wants. But there is a big difference between that. But today, both leader and the leaders of both parties are not interested in cutting one nickel out of overseas expenditures. Most of them want to increase it. And they're furious if you don't meet the automatic increases. And my suggestion is different. My suggestion is that we have problems here at home. We're spending too much money overseas. We're getting in too much trouble. Our obligation is to take care of the people here at home a long time before we ought to be the policemen of the world. So this means that I've made a modest suggestion for the first year in office, that is, Cut spending by one trillion dollars the first year. This would take some change in attitudes. Like I said, we have to have a change in our foreign policy. Not sacrifice one penny for defense, but stop spending so much money overseas. Now that should be a lot easier for we, the people, to come together, both liberals, moderates, conservatives, if they want to concentrate on taking care of America, why can't we come together and, and stop the spending overseas? I would think that would be the easiest place in the world to cut spending. So half of the spending that I'm proposing in that first year would come from overseas spending. 